And also, every aspect of our lives is a subset of the other. Your career affects your family. Your love life affects your job. Your health affects your career. Your social life affects your spirituality. And on and on. We all have subsets. Now, one can impact the other minimally or a lot. You know, depends on, on your choice and how you live. But they are all subsets of each other. They have some influence and impact on each other. Digital Audio Health by... Cymatrax. like to welcome to the show, Ronnie Loiza. Welcome to the show, Ronnie. Let the audience know a little bit about your background, because it's so interesting, all the places that you've lived. Well, hello, Rhonda, and it's so good to see you. I've, I feel like I know you very well, because I have been following you for a couple of years, but it's really neat when we just get to talk. And uh, yeah, I found out that you have been to Venezuela. I used to live there. Um, I live in Southern California, but, uh, you know, I've traveled quite a bit. I tr first traveled, got on a plane when I was one week old because my mom came to the United States to have me on purpose. She loved the United States. She loved New York City. So she came here the last few months of her pregnancy, had me in New York, and we flew back when I was a week old <laughs> and we went to Venezuela. Um, as my father's career was changing, um, they decided to come here. And he was changing from being an anesthesiologist to becoming an ophthalmologist. And we ended up staying in the United States. So I grew up here. So my mother tongue was Spanish, but I started kindergarten in English. And I also have a sister and a brother. Um, but it's neat to find out that you went to Venezuela. And uh, I, have, I used to have a lot of family down there, but they all left because of politics. Mm -hmm. So I have family spread out everywhere. I have family as well in Europe. And I have them here in the United States. A lot of them came, came here. Mm -hmm. That's wonderful. Thank you for sharing that. So how did you get into what you're doing now as a profession? Again, evolving. Mm -hmm. um, you know me as a life coach. I've, I've grown since then. We're always growing. When I first met you, the pandemic had just hit, but people were pivoting, new, looking for new careers. And um, I was a personal trainer. And when the pandemic hit, I had to shut down everything, shut down everything because the studios, I used to train people at private studios and in their homes and I couldn't go there anymore. Mm. And Rhonda, I was not a, you know, selfie Instagram reel kind of person. I was like, no, I wasn't shy, but I just didn't do that. Mm -hmm. And, you know, at the most I went to Facebook, but everybody went on Zoom. So I'm like, okay, here we go. So all my clients went on Zoom. I still have a, a good I think eight of them because I used to have like 28 running clients. I realized, oh my God, I'm driving around LA and I'm only able to train four people a day because of traffic. Um, here I was just training people back to back. But at the time, Rhonda, women especially were like, you know, I have a sister, you know, I have a friend who just were not working out. This was at the very onset of the pandemic because at the time, if you were the boss, you had to take care of that business and you had to take care of your clients and your staff. And if you were a team member or a staff member, you did not want to lose your job. So working out was the last thing on their mind. Although everybody thought, oh, buy a Peloton. Everybody was buying Pelotons. Yes. And now everybody's selling them on Facebook Marketplace. I knew yes. that would happen. <laughs> but, <laughs> you know, people are just not working out. I'm like, well, do you want me to talk to her? You want me to talk to them? And so I started talking to people. And Really, it was the mindset thing. I found out it, it was the fear of not being indispensable at work, but it was also like, I don't have time. I don't have time. They were on their laptop or whatever till nine at night, no boundaries. Then we started finding our way and finding our schedule, but they didn't want to work out in front of their kids or they were distracted or their partner was home. They felt self-conscious or for some reason, they just put themselves last. And I remember mm -hmm. somebody going, wow, you coached me really well because we would find how to do it. When I became a personal trainer, I, I came from PR and news. I, I was not athletic, none of it. I became a personal trainer because of health reasons for my own. And my personal trainer, who was put to me by my doctor, it's like, you have to be a personal trainer. 
you have to be a personal trainer. I'm like, I'm at, I'm 46 years old. Who does that? She's like, no, you have really improved your health. You don't hurt anymore because I used to hurt. I, I had really mm -hmm. bad issues with my, my back and my hip. Mm -hmm. You don't hurt anymore. You're in better health. You're a walking billboard. And as you grow older, if you're in good health and you're working out, people will relate to you, people your age and older. And I was like, well, so about a year later, I'm like, I think I'll become a personal trainer. Mm -hmm. And even then, when I became a personal trainer, my thing was, since I knew I wasn't like this big athletic gym rat, and yet I was in good health now, that I wanted to help each client be as healthy as that particular client could be as healthy as that person could be, no matter the issues, no matter what fitness level, no matter what age. So I also saw, Rhonda, at the time, it was 90% mindset. Yes, I passed the exams. Yes, I, I still do continuing education. Yes, you can study kinesthesiology, anatomy, all of that, and give them you know, a cookie cutter workout. But what really, really what people want is to work on their mindset. And even back then, I knew it. And so it was a lot of Let's make this natural. Listen, let's make this an easy way of your lifestyle. Because if you come to me right now and you lose weight or you get in better shape or whatever it is and you stop, what's the point? You have to change your lifestyle. So back to the pandemic, when I started talking to people, somebody said, you should be a life coach. And I'm like, what's a life coach? I was really cynical. I thought, you know, mm -hmm. Tony Robbins kind of thing. I wasn't sure. But I looked into it and I thought, okay, well, they're executive coaches or sports coaches. When I looked it up and saw there were so many different kinds of coaches from divorce coaches, relationship coaches, menopause coaches, midlife, I, I took it seriously. And I, I was trained. I was educated. I wanted to get ICF accredited um, training mm -hmm. and I became a life coach. Yay me. But the reason I loved it, it was no one has, has asked me for my certification or my certificate. I love showing it to them. But it was for me to feel like, okay, do I know what I'm doing? Do I know the ethics? Do I know the basics? And it was a lot of psychology and a lot of practice, a lot of practice hours. I wanted it for me, for my validation and to feel like I had a good foundation. And I've gone on. So I continued studying. I started practicing a lot of pro bono. Then I started getting clients and I decided to go up a level. So I'm now master. I'm a master certified professional coach. And what I found in all this is I thought I would be at first a fitness coach, you know, from my background, a lot of people would come to me with one thing and we would end up coaching them in so many aspects of their lives, especially mm -hmm. their family dynamics, especially career transition. And I have coached a lot and still am coaching a lot of people, not just women, but men in career transition, mm -hmm. in career growth, in midlife transition, um, which really surprised me. And I was scared at first, Rhonda, but like you, I, I love your inspiration. Like, listen, listen to yourself. If people are telling you you're helping them, listen. But mm -hmm. I was afraid because I'm, I'm like, I'm not a business coach. I don't know about finances and accounting. Well, you don't need that to really coach someone. And I learned that through my coaching education. Mm -hmm. But I was scared at first because it was the first time that I'm like, okay, I'm going to help you. And at first I thought, is it just all helping them with resumes or cover letters? And it's not that it really isn't. But in career transition, <laughs> I really saw that you have to be, you have to look at not just your resume skills, but first what fulfills you? What is your, what is your purpose? What truly deeply fulfills you? Go back to that. And that's pragmatic. It is not woo-woo. It is pragmatic. If you want mm -hmm. to call it woo-woo, throw in the woo. But you really got to tap back into what fulfills me no matter what, at what stage in my life. And that was the common thread. And then also Rhonda, your proven capabilities. I had the capabilities in me because if I had done this, then I am capable of doing that evidence. So not just your experience that you have on your resume, but your proven capabilities. And that counts in everything in life. If I was capable of enduring this, how am I capable of enduring that or conquering this or that? Mm -hmm. And so here is that you thought that it would be one thing when you were coaching, but what you, what you really found out is people wanted to, they really wanted help with their mindset. And it was their mindset that was going to make them successful, regardless of how many exercises you, you give them to work on their body. And is it that their psyche also has a relationship to the health of their body? 
Oh, 100%. Uh I'm a holistic, I'm a holistic practitioner. And that's, I've always connected mind, body, I say psyche, just to include everybody, but you can say mind, body, soul, mind, body, spirit. It's all integrative. It's all inclusive. And for whatever you believe, truly, we talk to ourselves. If you want to be totally pragmatic about it, whatever you say out loud and your brain hears it, it says noted, you're capable or you're right. Whether it's, and and this is why I'm now a certified Mm -hmm. habit coach, but whatever you're in the habit of saying to yourself, you are reprogramming yourself constantly, 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 whether it's a bad habit or a good habit, a good thought, a bad thought. You are just telling your brain that and it's going noted, noted. You're, we reprogram ourselves every day, all day. And so, yes, it's when people come to me for coaching, they usually have like one particular goal. I want to get a new job within two months or I want to lose weight in one month or whatever it is, Mm -hmm. they have a particular Mm -hmm. goal. And it always comes to breaking down to what is in your mind? What have you said in your mind? Because we conditioned ourselves and we have been conditioned and we keep reconditioning ourselves every day. So yes, it does come down to mindset. It's not all mindset. Of course, Mm -hmm. you have to take action, whatever aspect of your life it is. And also every aspect of our lives is a subset of the other. Your career affects your family. Your love life affects your job. Your health affects your career. Your social Mm -hmm. life affects your spirituality and on and on. We all have subsets. Now, one can impact the other minimally or a lot, you know, depends on on your choice and how you live, but they are all subsets of each other. They have some influence and impact on each other. Mm -hmm. And the subconscious mind is filing away the repetition that a person has ongoing and we don't realize that we get up and live the same day over and over and over and over and over again until we change what it is but lots of us don't know that we need to change what we're doing a lot of people would rather stay the Mm -hmm. way they are right now than to make that step so what would you say to a person who is stuck starting to realize that they're stuck what would be the first thing that you would advise them to do to just make that first initial step to whatever they're going to do? Let's say go swimming each morning or five days a week or four days a week or whatever, or mm-hmm. doesn't matter. Let us know. <laughs> well, you, you just described the status quo and there are different things we hold on. I forgot his name. Uh, are you a Lord of the Rings fan? Uh, not too much. I, so I, I'm not going to know the person that you're going to tell me. <laughs> Gondorf, Gondorf. Someone's going to correct us. Anyway, it was this little creature who would just not let go of the ring. It's the Gondorf Mm -hmm. effect because you would rather hold on tightly to something that you You work so hard for, even if it's not what you want, Mm -hmm. than get everything else you want because you work so long or you you've worked at this marriage or you've you've done this for so long that even if it's a little bit and it's not what you want, you're going to hold on to it. Or the status quo is what you said is I'm, I'm just living the status quo because it's easier. It's what you know. Mm-hmm. Our, even, even us who love to travel and love adventure and all that, for the most part, the human psyche is afraid of change. We are afraid to change. Even a bad habit because you get a reward from it. Bad or good, you're getting some kind of chemical reaction to that. It's an instant reward. Even if we have a long-term dream or goal, our instant reward is what we live off. So I don't advise people and I don't consult them. That's just it. And here's the, I'm going to sound all Yoda-ish part, but it, the answer is in you. I'm not in your brain. I'm not in your conditioning. I'm not in your dreams and desires. It's like layer after layer, go inside, 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 like a sci-fi effect. You know what you want and you know deep down in your core what you truly believe about something. You do. Often you're afraid to admit it for whatever Mm -hmm. reason, because of your family, your society, your instant community, your religion, whatever it is. But you know, ask yourself. There's no, Mm -hmm. I don't know in life. You do know. You have an opinion. You have a perspective. You know? I've heard that people really don't know. I mean, I, I've heard that people really don't know what they're to do. They don't know why they're here. And so they've, they've lived out repetition for so long that they themselves got lost along the way and need to, let's say, have exercises to help them really get in touch and uncover themselves. Can yeah. you speak to that? Yes, it, you said it exactly. Notice I didn't say, Rhonda, that I didn't 
that I didn't say, you know what to do. We don't know what to do. And we yeah. choose to feel overwhelmed. Yes. I'm saying, you know, deep down what you want yes. and what you value. Now, what do I do about it? How do I get there? The steps, right? Mm -hmm. So that all comes into habits. That's where I, okay. I throw in that. I saw that as the common thread with everything. You're like, really? Habits? But let's just say, because you're going to go back to the fitness, but this counts in career and time management and how you're in the habit of expressing yourself, how you're in the habit of dealing with different people, how you're in the habit of acting with your husband or your wife or your partner. We are in the habit of, but let's go back to habits. Uh, a meta study, which is um, a collection of different types of studies and research at different points with different people, maybe different countries, and then they get them all together and they compare. Meta studies in the past decade but the most recent ones, I was so excited in 2023, 40 mm -hmm. to 50%, I think more, but that's just my opinion, 40 to 50% of our entire day. And I'm saying like from the minute you get up in the morning to when you go to bed at night. So that's what, 18 hours, I'm just assuming. 40 to 50%, that's nearly a half of our day is just a series of habits. That's mm -hmm. it. Look at it. So that's your identity. If you write a, a play or a book or a movie. The first thing you do is you write down the characters, but what make what makes us remember characters and their roles? Are there quirks, their habitual way of being in that screen and that story? You know, the things that they do, not just their looks, not just their mm -hmm. names or their age. You know, it's like, aha, you get to know their character. Well, that's who we are. Our, I'm not saying that our habits are our personalities, but whoever you are, Rhonda, your habits are sort of a product of that but mostly they feed into your personality. They really do because what is a personality, a persona and how you come off? Well, how do you come off? Because of all your, what are you doing every day? A habit is something you do consistently every day without thinking about it. And you name the subconscious. That comes from your subconscious mind. So how I work with people is we look at whatever their goal is. And let's say, okay, I finally, you know, I'm 50 years old, I'm 40 years old, whatever it is. I, I've tried so many diets. I've tried so many exercises. I'm just not as strong. You know, my metabolism slowed down. I could give them a diet. Every diet in the world works if you do it. The problem is it's not sustainable. Yes. That's not how we live. What do you value? What do you want? So I go layer after layer. It's like, well, what's your goal? Well, I want, and people usually come to me with two or three goals. It's like, okay, mm -hmm. what's your main goal? Okay, pick one thing. And then I ask them why. And then, well, why that? So let's say, well, I want to lose 25 pounds in two months. Well, why? Because I want to be in better health. What's better health to you? And we keep going. And I want to feel more confident. Why do you want to feel more confident? And that's where it starts getting good. That's where they start discovering themselves. Mm -hmm. What does confident mean to them? Does it mean like I'm able to walk in the room and I know I, I who people like me? I want to feel like people like me. I want to feel like what I, I say matters. I want to feel for once that I have agency. I mean, things come out and usually it goes back to their childhood. This is not therapy, but a lot of it is like a lot of stuff that they're working out from childhood. I mean, our mm -hmm, inner child mm -hmm. is with us every day, but we go down to the nitty gritty or I want to be healthier because my, my blood pressure is high and I want to be able to play with my grandchildren. I mean, we hear this all the time, but it's like, they're looking at their mortality. They're looking at how they hurt. They want to get up out of the, out of bed one morning and just not hurt anymore. Whatever it is, we go down deep, deep, deep. What do you value? And then we start with, um, and there's a lot to this, to the process, but we look at possible tiny actions, not even habits yet. Pick some actions, like 10 actions of what you can do toward this goal. And usually they come up with 10 to 20, and then they want to do like three or four of them. It's like, no, nah, let's rate them. How effective is each one? We rank them. How effective, how easy, how enjoyable, all of that. And then, mm -hmm. you know, you come up with, okay, this is the highest scoring one. You're still an adult. You can pick the lowest scoring one, but which one do you want to do? And people are usually resistant at first. Like, well, I can do two or three of them. Like, nah, let's start small. Let's start small. Just pet the horse. Don't ride it. Let's start small. Let's just do one tiny action. And they finally pick an action that they know they can do mm -hmm. realistically. And I do tell them that 
the best thing is to pick somebody, I mean, pick something that they will do or most likely to do, I almost said more, most likely to do when you don't feel like it, when you're tired, when you're lethargic, when you're being a brat to yourself, the one thing that you'll do when you don't feel like it, when you're at your lowest. So then we have a chain that we link it to something you already do. So you don't add more to your day. Mm-hmm. You just already do it to something. And then you nurture it, you nurture it. And you put on an experimental mindset. We're scientists now, we're data tracking, we're tweaking. Let's see what's working. Let's give it a little repetition time. And it's not, you know, I've, I've heard Rhonda, it takes 21 days to form a habit. It takes 40 days to form a habit. It takes 60 days to form a habit. None of it is true. All the research shows that it takes some people some time and other people other times. It's not about the length of time. There's no secret formula. Yeah. It's how much you do it. Practice, practice, repetition, 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 repetition. Mm-hmm. So if you do something once a week, it's not going to ingrain as much as if you do it every day. So it's not the length of time because it depends on the person. It can range from 30 days all the way to 185 days. So it's repetition. And what I do, I don't know if you've noticed in, in, in my LinkedIn profile, I came up with celebrative accountability. Yes. I hold them accountable because I love holding people accountable, but that doesn't mean I'm nagging you or nudging you or scolding you because people will start ghosting you if you do that. If they don't want accountability, it's like, oh, I didn't do it today. I'm going to hide. I'm uh. No, it's celebrate celebrate, celebrate. That's what I have turned accountability into. Mm. Celebrate yourself because when your coach is not around or your boss is not around or your friend or your partner's not around to ask you about it or tell you to do it, be accountable to yourself. Mm -hmm. So celebrate. So I tell people as you are about to do the action is that you're on your way to do it. This I do instruct them. I invite them to celebrate. I'm going to go do it. Even if it's just neutral, I'm going to go do it. I'm about to do it. I'm starting to do it. Take glee in it if you want, but if you're like resistant, fine, be resistant, be whatever you are, but say it out loud. I'm about to do it or I'm starting to do it. They start getting in good moods about it. It's like, oh, I'm starting. Even if it's just one word, starting. And then as they're doing the action, I'm doing it, say it out loud. Better yet, celebrate it. If you don't feel like it, don't, but celebrate it. Whatever you feel like, yay, yay me. Because your mind, your brain hears that and goes capable, noted, Mm -hmm. input. And then as soon as you finish, did it, done. Now, when they start with me, they do check in with me. Some of them just find the the green emoji, like a check mark, Mm -hmm. a green check mark. Some people say done, did it. Other people, yay, I did it. I felt great, blah, blah, blah. Or like every day they write me a sentence. But just as long as you celebrate it out loud as you're telling me, because you get in the habit of celebrating, they start getting a good mood about it and liking it. You're celebrating yourself. That's accountability. And so it starts reprogramming and giving you that dopamine, Mm -hmm. that dopamine. That's the instant reward, that instant gratification that we all want, whether it's a bad habit or good habit. And that's how it forms and evolves into a habit. And again, remember the experimental mindset. If something's not working and you find like I slipped, if you slip once, that's fine. We're human. But if you choose to let it slip again or you quit the second day or the third day, okay, that's failure. Unless you hop back on board. But if it's more often than not that you're not doing it, let's find out why. And Mm -hmm. it doesn't mean they failed or they just can't. It just means, okay, that's not working. Let's see why. What did you feel? What was going on? And we tweak it. This is a lab. This is a lab experiment. Put on that white coat and just look at it like we're just data tracking. And, And we adjust. And then it becomes a habit. And then we can grow on that. We can progress that habit to more. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, I have myself, I have daily habits. And I shouldn't even say the word habit. Well, I guess I do. Yeah, I have habits. I have rituals that I do. And I make myself accountable to my list. And sometimes I have to miss a day if I'm traveling or whatever. I miss a day and I miss what I'm doing or two days. And in the past, and I mean, going back a few years ago, if I missed a day, I would miss another day and I'd feel bad and then feel worse. And then to the point where I'm just not even going to go back to it because I'm feeling so horrible right now. And I think it's human nature. I mean, we disappoint really quickly and it's hard for us to sort of get back on the horse when you fall off. And 
So I really liked how you set this up, but what if you were working with me and that's the mindset that I had? What would you do? Because I'm not like, unlike anybody in our audience. And so what would you do to help me if I am regimented and I, you know, go to the Y four times a a week to swim and I miss three days in a row and now it's the weekend, I'm not going. And how do I get myself in the pool Monday morning at six o'clock? It's going to be cold. That, I mean, that's the reality of this, right? Right. Well, I do ask people, what's the easiest thing? How can you get yourself back on track? What's the easiest thing that you can do? So Rhonda, what would be the easiest thing that you can do to do anything toward, let's say we're talking your exercise, toward exercise on Sunday to prepare for Monday? What would be the easiest thing? Pack my backpack, pack my suit, my towels, everything that I need for the day, have it all ready so that when I get up, I've already set myself up that I'm going to the pool. That's what I do. That's what I've taught myself to do. (laughs) Yeah, you did. And now what's going to get you to what will activate you uh, packing your backpack? With the hope that that's exactly what I'm going to do is get in the pool and swim. Are you sure hope is enough to poke you to go pack your your bags and and put your towel where you see it and everything? Good question. Thank you. What is mixed up in there is my long-term goal. And the long-term goal is health. And when you don't do, pretty soon you can't do, right? Mm -hmm. So I think of that. I'm young enough. I can still do this. I can still stay in shape. And it's what I can do is swim. So I think of the long-term goal in health and fitness, my clothes are going to fit better. And it's just tomorrow. I'm just packing for tomorrow. I'm not packing for the whole week. So I'm not setting myself up for the next day. I'm only addressing one day. I address one day at a time. So you started looking at your long-term goal, which is goes back to where we started. Yes. Why? Why? And then why? Well, why that? Well, why that? Well, why that? Yes. So it's like, cause I can now because I'm young enough and I can physically, um, that's the other, th- well, we'll, we'll go into that, but yeah. so I would, I would then let's say we're, we're on boxer. Cause that's where I coach people. Um, it's a platform and it's, I, a lot of coaches are using it now because it takes you off of WhatsApp and, and Viber oh, and the text yes. because text can get lost. So when I get a notification in boxer, I know it's just my coaching clients. So then I would say, how about we go do it now? Carry me with you, go ahead and pack it and celebrate yourself. So as everything you just said, how about saying it out loud? Talk yourself into it if that's what works for you. So when you Mm -hmm. asked me, what would I, how would I work with you? I'd ask you, well, what's the easiest thing you could do right now? How can you get yourself back into it? For you, it was talking yourself into it and going back to your why. For other people, it could be, I got to get up and do it right now, or I'll do five minutes or, and you know, instead of going to the gym, well, I, I, I'll do five minutes of calisthenics in the morning or I'll I'll stretch tonight. You know, oh yeah, last night a lady hadn't worked out in a week because all of a sudden 4th of July came here in the United States. And I'm like, what's the easiest thing you could do? Can you do something tonight? Because it was East Coast time, her time, and I'm on West Coast. It's like, well, I can't work out now. I'm like, can you stretch for one minute or some sit-ups? And she's like, yeah. She texted me later. She boxed me. She said, oh, I ended up doing something for, for 10 minutes. Like, great. But I just said great. one minute. That's it. Yes. So whatever it is, you decide your action. Let's say, for example, I have a lady who's working with me in decluttering mm-hmm. and she's always overwhelmed. And she took me on a virtual tour of her place and there were just laundry everywhere, dishes. And it's like, you know, I can see why it would feel overwhelmed. Yeah. And she's listened to decluttering podcasts and inspirational things. And she's read the books, but she can't get herself to do it. So yeah. we started with five minutes a day following an activator, what will activate you to do it? So she has a morning, like you said, you have rituals and routines. So after I do the tea and I do my yoga, she links the decluttering for five minutes with her yoga. Mm. And then she rewards herself, jumps up and down, whatever. Um, And but she's like, but five minutes? I'm like, yeah, five. If you end up decluttering more, great, but five and then go to work. She's been decluttering five minutes a day, and it's really inspired her Mm. to not drop her clothes on the floor when she undresses at night. She puts it in the hamper, like she smells it, puts it in the hamper, or she hangs it. And then she's, this is just her, she's got this little poster board, magnetic sticky thing right next to her closet, and she puts a sticker every time she does it. So Mm. she's rewarding herself by looking at the stickers every day. 
you know, she's a grown woman. She's in her thirties. She loves those stickers. That's what works for her. Yeah, but, you know, beautiful. and some people like just five minutes a day. Yeah, but she just cleared out five minutes of something. And if it goes longer, fine. Same with, uh, you know, like working out. People at first are like just five minutes a day. What's that going to do? I don't go to the physiology, you know, five, that's 25 minutes during the week. That will lower your blood pressure. This will get your heart going. This will, that, I don't go into all that. It's like, mm -hmm. well, it'll get your brain to go, oh, it's time. Oh, it's time. Oh, it's time. You know? At the same time, same location, mm -hmm. same context, after you do one thing, you chain it to something, you get in the habit of doing something. Yes. So back to your Monday morning, I would talk you into, well, how do you think? What's the easiest thing you can do? Again, you're in a routine. Routines are not habits. You said, I might not do something. Like, let's say somebody is used to doing um, social media posts and content on LinkedIn, but then they have to travel. And if they can't, they can't. Fine. We always work with, if something happens that day, then I will do this. Mm -hmm. Always plan A, plan B, plan C. You okay. always have a backup plan. What are your barriers? What are your possible barriers? What are some things that can get in your way? We go through all that as we begin, because you already want to see the possible uh, roadblocks. You already want to see them and kind of plan for them. So you don't have an excuse. And again, routines are different than habits. Your habits, your healthiest, most fundamental foundational habits support your routines so you can get back on it. Like you mentioned, you traveled. I, I went away. Um, and whenever I travel, I do not bother my family. I do not bother my husband by me imposing my working out. I'm in the habit. It's part of my identity of exercising. So it'd be weird if I didn't. It would feel weird. I would feel ucky. I'm used to working out in the evening after everything, after coaching, after taking care of other people. And then the last thing I do is I work out, I shower, I get in something comfortable and I cuddle up with my husband, you know, we eat dinner, whatever. But if I travel or if I'm going off to a conference or something, I get up first thing in the morning mm -hmm. because that's my plan B. That way I'm free the rest of the day. I don't have to impose myself like, oh, I have to get back to the hotel and work out. Mm -hmm. No, I did it. Done. Because that's my identity. That's another thing, Rhonda. We go back to, yes. your, and I know that you think this because I, I, I see what you post. It's all in your identity. Who are you? Mm -hmm. It's if I'm a healthy person, what does a healthy person do? If I'm a person that works out, what does the person who works out do? You find when to work out. You work out. If I'm an author, what does an author do? I write. You know? <laughs> I know. So you get or back you to it. <laughs> Yeah, you get back to it because it's part of your identity. A lot of people look at what strategy, what hack, give me a plan, give me a program. And then they take everything in the program that they learn. Like they go to a motivational conference and they put everything under their arm and they're like, they run with it. Like, I'm going to do all of these things. And then they don't. It starts dropping out from under their arm because it's a lot. You're not mm -hmm. used to doing all that. So take one tiny action, form it into a habit, nurture it so it's natural and innate and a part of your identity. And then you grow from there. Tiny step, tiny step. So most people go at it with, what's my goal? Well, how do I reach this goal? Then they go to the process as opposed to identity. When you align your new habit to your identity, then it's part of you. That's what you work toward, to making it part of who you are. It's your identity. What does a, whatever that you do three times a week, but you didn't get to do it when you were off. What does that person do? Maybe you do a little bit. Maybe you just do a little like five minutes in the hotel room or whatever it is. You know what I mean? So mm -hmm. it, it, when we base it on what do we truly value and who do we want to be, it becomes mm -hmm. part of your identity. And it's so much easier instead of discipline, instead of revving up mm -hmm. that willpower. Because really, I find that women that get burned out and men too is because they're constantly revving up the willpower and it gets exhausting. The people that are the most successful at forming who they are, are the ones that don't depend on willpower. They have the self-control because again, it comes from their subconscious. It's part of who they are. I love that because, you know, when you go off to a conference and you listen to all, all these new strategies and everything, and you have the strategies, but it takes a lot of, you have to work up the willpower to do the exercises that they've given you because it's not part of who you are and it just drops away yeah you know you're exhausted so <laughs> i really love that you talked about that because a lot of people think that they have to have willpower and it's not about that at all 
And it's working with yourself for so long that you stop cheating yourself of your own life and you stop telling yourself the stories that have really not benefited you and you start getting real with yourself and that's what makes you take care of yourself not this willpower <laughs> and there's power in your will what's a will there's power you in your will, will. Perfect. yeah it's what that's you want it's what you want. Like you started, I believe I, I, please correct me because it was so long ago. I recall you sharing how you started writing your book. I think that you were just journaling, I believe. And then you realized you were writing. So you start, it became your book. Is that correct? Yes. Initially, that's what I did. But the reason I started writing things down is I had a near death experience. Yeah. And in my recovery, I was in a trance like state because I had hit the back of my head, nothing, you know, I didn't break anything. It was, it was actually amazing that I even walked, I didn't walk away from it, but I did not have a scratch on me. And it was sort of a trance like, and I went to my computer and I started writing, but I didn't know I was writing a book. All I knew is that I had information that I wanted to put down. And then it occurred to me after a couple of weeks, because when you write every day, Mm -hmm. In a couple of weeks, you've got more than a chapter <laughs> and you start realizing, and because I didn't have a brain injury, but I banged my head pretty hard on the seat rest a couple of three times. Yeah. And, and that's what I think. I didn't have a headache or anything, but I think that, you know, your brain can bounce around in your head by trauma like that. It's just brain trauma. And of course, you know, it heals over time, but I felt like I was a robot or in a trance state when I was doing that work. And, well, and then, of were, course, then it, you come out of it, right? After you, you were weeks. kind of in a dream state. And I just a dream state. Yeah. In, you brought from your subconscious, what you were writing down was in your brain. It was. You brought from your subconscious, like I said, you chose to bring it to your conscious mind and put it down and write it out. That's exactly what you did. That's what we do with habits. You had it in there and you brought it to the forefront and wrote mm -hmm. it down. And then you got in the habit of doing it every day. And all of a sudden you have a book. And all of a sudden I had a book. <laughs> it was amazing. <laughs> it was amazing because I hadn't started out that way. But it's interesting how things happen in your life. And I've interviewed some people who, you know, and, and we can draw parallels. It was around the same time I had my accident. I've interviewed people who've had an accident and their process was the same. Is they ended up writing a book. And I find it very interesting. And I think that... Uh, you know, we're here for a reason. We're here to remember why we've come here. And I think that if we don't pay attention, if we keep on just running full force with our life, which I was doing, and not paying attention to the intuitions, the synchronicities, and all those types of things. And, you know, there's a higher power that needs you to do certain things. They want you to do certain things in order to get your attention. They do have to give you a smack on the head sort of thing. And that's what I ended up with was a couple of smacks on the back of my head from the accident that stopped me in my tracks. But there's a lot of things that led up to that. There were indications that I needed to slow down and then I needed to pay attention to myself. And that is what happened. And it, it's happening to a lot of people. I think the, there's a whole shift here in human consciousness, that's helping people. And it starts with exercising, but it's the discipline of the exercising that actually helps your brain to recalibrate you, because you start to feel better. And when you start to feel better, you want to do more things. And then you start influencing by hook or by crook other people. And you don't really realize what you're doing and that you're just sharing the new you really, or the you that you've now, you've stepped into the true essence of who you are. And I, I love that. And see, that's exactly it. And some people, um, it, we're just philosophizing here, but yes. you can, you, there are different perspectives of this. Mm -hmm. Some people think like, I'm kind of being a devil's advocate. So I'm not disagreeing sure. with you. I'm giving another perspective sure. because people are, many people are challenged with, they come to me because like, Ronnie, I just, you know, I, I don't have a calling. Nothing's speaking to me. I can't meditate. They feel like they're going to sit there and like Moses, something's going to come into their brain. Mm. It's like, well, what do you, and so I go back to, 
if you don't believe something happens for a reason, did something happen because of a reason? There's always cause and effect. Yeah. Everything. That leaf just fell on the sidewalk because the wind pushed it off that branch. There's always cause and effect if you want to be that scientific about it and that factual. Right. So if, if things have had been happening in your life, something prompted it. Don't qualify it. Don't say it was bad or good. Don't judge it with mm-hmm. whatever, uh, a moral. It just happened. It's a fact. Let's look at the facts. So mm-hmm. if something happened because of something, how does that affect you? Why, if something twinges you, if something keeps like grabbing your eye, grabbing your attention, making you feel a certain emotion, that's what I get people to look at. Like, you know, you have a belief about that. You have an opinion. You have a feeling. What's that feeling? Let's just go there. Well, what's your thought there? Maybe that's your calling. If you keep thinking about something or feeling a certain way about something and you feel like you have to make a change, then we go into why. Mm -hmm. It's not going to be, you know, typed out for you and handed to you on a piece of paper, you know why. We find, we discover what is it that you want to do? What is it that you want to leave as your legacy or whatever Mm -hmm. it is? What's your reason? What's your motive? Your Mm -hmm. motive is your motivation. So if you don't believe like, okay, answers will come to me if I meditate and you're not one of those, fine, let's find what does work for you. You know, I found a lady, it's interesting because you're you're talking about um, create creativity and how you became the writer that you are. Um, And you're a writer because you write. It's always in you. We all, you know, I, I read something the other day. Maybe it was you. Um, the cemetery is full of of people who uh, took a book to their graves, uh, uh, took what was in their mind to their graves or something like that. I'm paraphrasing. Yeah, they took the graveyard is full of unlived dreams. Oh, th- that one I've heard. But there's mm-hmm. also one for writers full of people with that book, the book they never wrote in their, br- the in, their in the grave. Yeah. yeah. But I have a lady who just, she's like, I try to meditate. I don't have time. Um, I try to get her to do EFT, you know, um, tapping for like a minute because of that, that I love. She's like, oh, well, maybe. And she started to doodle. This happened a couple of years ago. I'm like, what do you like to do? And I'm like, what are you doing? Because mm-hmm. I could see on Zoom, she was doing something. She's like, I'm so sorry. I'm paying full attention. But I, I she held it up. She doodles, just squiggly mm-hmm. lines. And then sometimes a line and then a line from that. And she's like, I do that when I'm in, co- in meetings and stuff. I'm like, all right, doodle. And she's like, now I'm like, no, no, doodle. That, that'll be your ritual. Because she was looking, trying to look for, for creativity. Wow. And I'm like, she's like, okay. Because she thought, I can't journal because I write the same thing every day. I can't do a gratitude journal because I write the same thing every day. She just, she was very cynical about it. And she couldn't meditate. She couldn't do this. She couldn't do that. I'm like, doodle. Let's doodle every morning for no reason. Mm-hmm. Don't do it while you're listening to other people. Literally just sit with yourself in silence and doodle. Nothing else. Don't listen to the news. Nothing. So that's what we decided to do. She would think of something wrong. She'd be like, okay, this is silly, but all right, I'll try it. And I forget what time we gave her because you choose your time. You could do it for a minute, five minutes, 10 minutes. What would you realistically do? And so she would sit down and start doodling. She's like, she would think of something and write it down. And then she would keep doodling. And then she'd think, oh my gosh. And then she keep, and then she'd like go to her computer and write something out, but she would have to go back to doodle because she would turn the timer off because she committed to doodling for however long time it was. I forget. Mm-hmm. Wow. She came up with an entire program. She wanted to teach art, but she didn't, she wasn't a painter per se, mm-hmm. but she wanted to teach people how to get in the mindset of doing their art. Anyway, she came up with this whole program. Wow. I'm not saying that it all came out of her doodling. But it got her creative juices flowing. The job mm-hmm. she had wasn't creative. I think there's creativity in any job, but that's my opinion. But she mm-hmm. saw her job. I forget what it was, but it was something in business. And she just didn't see the creative side. But she found her ritual, her zen, her way of mm-hmm. just silencing for no intention. And she connected with herself and things would come up from her subconscious, just that's like right. what came out of your subconscious. Yes. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so she by doodling, she accessed a part of her brain that revealed to her what her mission is. I love doodling. When I started podcasting, I was I was in audio. And so what I did is I kept myself busy while doodling. So I keep my closed so, so that people could talk because I'm a talker. And it just kept me my, you know, so I didn't respond to every single thing that my guest said. I just let my guest speak. And then after a while, I learned silence, <laughs> let the oh, guest, wow. let yeah. the guest teach the audience what the guest has, wants to and needs to. 
and feels like they want to teach the audience. You're listening to Courting Your Soul with Rhonda Grant, whose podcast has been treated with digital audio health by my sponsor, Cymatrex. And today I have the absolute pleasure to speaking with Ronnie Loiza. That was and perfect. she is going to let you know how you may reach out to her and connect. I'm Ronnie Lowe, Life Coach. Um, a client of mine said that one day and it just stuck. Ronnie Lowe, because Lowe is my last name, Ronnie Lowe, Life Coach. And you can find me at RonnieLowLifeCoach.com. That's my website, Ronnie Lowe. That's R O N N I E L O, LifeCoach.com. I'm also Ronnie Lowe, Habit Coach. I'm a certified habit coach. And you can find me on all social media under Ronnie Lowe, Life Coach. Or, yeah, I think I'm in Instagram and LinkedIn. I invite you to find me on LinkedIn. I'm on there a lot. Um, that's where I watch Rhonda all the time. So, and I invite you just to get a hold of me and let's see what it is that you, you want to talk about. I, I love listening and I love chatting and helping you discover what you really want and what you really believe and how you can get there T easily, easily beautiful. with tiny doable steps. Yeah, beautiful. I just love it. Do you feel that you have been called to your mission, crafted it or a bit of both? First, a call but I really had to listen instead of like, no, how is that possible? And the calling again, I think is within me. Mm -hmm. You know, I believe in God, but um, whatever you believe in, at least believe in yourself. If something is in your mind, it's like, okay, what is this thought? What is this emotion? Mm -hmm. So I had a calling, but I wasn't sure what it was. And then it was more in your face when somebody said you should be a coach. Yes. And then I had, to, uh, it's like, well, how do I do that? I explored it. I took it seriously. So for me, I went ahead and got the education. So both, you have to craft it and you have to practice it. You have to practice it because you learn from your clients. You learn doing it. You learn from your mistakes. And I, I don't even call them mistakes. You learn from like, well, that didn't work. You know, your experimental mind. So both. But at first it was something that said, okay, I want to look into this. And I that I consider a calling. And then when I did it. And when I first started coaching and I was nervous about it, and then I saw the results with my clients, mm -hmm. then I felt like, wow, that's what fulfilling feels like. And I felt that as a personal trainer, but I never felt it when I was in PR. And when I was in the media, I, I liked my jobs and I was, you know, paid for it. And people thought, wow, you have a great job. You have a great career. But I was like, wow, that's fulfilling. And I am so happy. And look at me, I felt fulfilled in my 50s with my new vocation. Mm -hmm. It took that long. Wonderful. And you know, you said something really interesting is that people would say to you, I think you should do that, or I think you should be that. And we have to pay attention to those present day messengers, because sometimes they are there to guide us and help us with our mission as well. What extraordinary discovery have you found in your life? In my life. Oh mm -hmm. my gosh. We could be here another three hours. But Okay, um... I just want one. <laughs> I can qualify that. I'm just gonna go with the most recent one, but yes. I, I do think I discovered this a long time ago. You know mm -hmm. the saying read between the lines? Mm -hmm. Even as a little girl, and especially as at my formative years, eight to twenty something, I could hear between the lines. I could hear people talking to each other. And know where, oh, here they are. Here comes the miscommunication. Or I could hear how they're not communicating. I could hear what they really mean. I was always like on everybody else's radio frequency, really paying attention. Um, I know you probably think I'm very talkative here because I'm a guest, but I'm often very quiet and listening. And I'm like at a party. I'm just boom, boom, tuning to other people left and right and eavesdropping, but because they're in my earshot. So that was a discovery I had that I really hear between the lines. But my newest discovery is <laughs> we are set in our ways. We all are. We have a certain conditioning. You can be set in your ways, but you don't have to be stuck there. I don't care what situation you're in. I don't care how old you are. You don't have to be stuck there. It's never too late. That's my latest discovery. And I found love the second time around with my husband. I was married before. Um, I'm his third wife and last one. We are such giddy good friends. Yeah. We're lovers, we're friends. And it's like, wow, this is possible even at my age. And mm. that's what I discovered. It's never too late. 
What a beautiful message. Wonderful. Some people needed to hear that today. Thank you so much for being on the show. We've known each other for a while. And uh, so I'm really glad that we've had the opportunity to have this wonderful conversation. You're a brilliant, brilliant lady. I've really enjoyed this. Wow. Thank you, Rhonda. That's a lot coming from you because um, I'm a big fan and supporter of yours. So thank you so much. And um, I'm really grateful to be connecting with your audience. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you for listening to Courting Your Soul with Rhonda Grant, whose podcast has been treated with digital audio health by my sponsor, Sinotrack. Theme song for Courting Your Soul is Sun on the Water, composed and performed by John Park Wheeler.